Okay, hey, hope we take a start now. Good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the globe you may be joining us from. Greetings. Welcome to SIDS Talk Plastics. SIDS Talk Plastics is a series of public virtual discussions into the areas of interest to small island states as the international community negotiates a global plastics agreement. My name is Saeed Hamid, and I provide support to the Alliance of Small Island States in its work towards the development of an international legally binding instrument on plastic pollution, including in the marine environment. Now, it is that bit on the inclusion of the marine environment that is part of the impetus for why we're all here today. We should all be quite familiar with the devastating impacts of plastic pollution. However, these impacts are experienced disproportionately by the small island states for many reasons, including the transboundary nature of the issue and the millions of tons of plastics in the seas and oceans. The purpose of this discussion is to share insights and views on the importance of remediation to SITS, the current state of technology, possible examples or models within existing international law, including discussions on potential implications and key issues to consider in designing remediation mechanisms under the instrument. To this end, we have convened a most excellent panel of, of speakers with a variety of disciplines. In no particular order, please join me in welcoming Ms. Anima Salofa, Lead Oceans Negoti Negotiator for EOSIS, Dr. Alexandra Harrington, Chair for the Agreement on Plastic Pollution Task Force, IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, Dr. Zhao Ribeiro, Bidao, and please forgive me if I mispronounce any of the names, you feel free to correct me when you, once you've started, who is also the General Counsel and Director of Global Public Affairs at the Ocean Cleanup, Eduin Rognarod, Research Scientist at the Norwegian Institute for Water Research, and Hannah Pragnell Rash, Project Specialist and Consultant for Global Ghost Gear Initiatives. We will proceed by asking our panelists to deliver short presentations on the topic at hand, after which we will have a moderated panel discussion, then we will open the floor for questions using the question and answer feature in the chat box. Thank you all for participating as panelists today, it is an absolute pre pre privilege to serve as your moderator. As you can see, we do have a stack list of speakers for the next hour, so without further delay, I will first give the floor to Ms. Adama Salopa. Thank you, Saeed, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. As Saeed has um, introduced me, I'm Anna Masolofa with the um, uh, AOSIS team here in New York, and I'm very um, pleased to be speaking to you this morning on New York time. Let me just quickly share my screen. One moment, please. So what? All right, my apologies for that. Um, so this morning, I'm just gonna quickly run through a few things um, from the AOSIS team, um, beginning with an overview um, on the background of plastics, um, the impacts of plastic pollution and how uh, this impacts, or how this affects SIDS, um, a little bit into the Global Plastics Treaty and Remediation, and, rem and some recommend, just highlighting a few recommendations. Um, we're all familiar with plas plastics. Plastics are ubiquitous, they're non-biodegradable, they're toxic, mat toxic materials. Um, there's about 11 million tons of plastic waste from all across the globe um, leaking into the marine environment um, annually. 80% of these come from land-based sources. Um, in terms of pr uh, production, there's 300 million tons of plastics produced annually, um, and this is set to triple, to almost triple by uh, 2050, um, with current patterns of production and consumption, looking to also threaten mankind's attempts to meet the Paris Agreement and combat um, uh, climate change. Plastic pollution, um, including in the marine environment, is part of the triple planetary crisis and contributes to the devastating impacts on human health, livelihoods, economies, and the environment. So how are SIDS proportionately or disproportionately affected? Generally, SIDS encounter an array of um, unique challenges when faced with environmental challenges um, due to the small sizes, remoteness, a narrow resource base, and reliance on 
certain industries uh, with uh, susceptibilities to economic shock. Um, in terms of geographic locations, SIDS are geographically uh, situated in close proximity to ocean dryers, where currents naturally accumulate floating material, including plastic litter. Much of this ends up on island coastlines. Um, there are also limited capabilities to respond, um, presenting an overburden on limited resources avail um, available to effectively respond to pressing environmental issues, including plastic pollution. There's also limited te technology and legislation in place um, and uh, affecting um, SIDS in such a way um, that there is a deficit in technical technological solutions and sound legislative frame frameworks for resolving the plastic pollution issues that are faced by SIDS. So in terms of livelihoods, the different aspects of um, that uh, in, in which um, plastic pollution affects um, uh, SIDS. We begin with livelihoods, where knowing that SIDS rely, many SIDS rely on fisheries for food security and as an economic resource. Um, although yields have been on decline, decline with marine plastic pollution identified as a, marine, as a major contributor, marine transport services are also affected with plastic debris and fishing gear tangling um, with vessels. In terms of health, um, traditional diets are seafood based and with plastics entering the food web, there are concerns for hormonal, biological and physiological changes to, um, this is to human systems. Um, polluted marine environments also serve as breeding grounds for disease and vectors, which could overburden the health sectors of SIDS. Um, many SIDS are multicultural and diverse, um, practitioner, practitioners of different um, uh, of Hinduism, um, African spiritualism, and indigenous traditional customs frequently make use of lakes, streams, rivers, and coastal waters in the exercise of beliefs. However, pollution diminishes the ability of people to do so. Um, tourism is the largest economic driver among SIDS um, is affected when um, plastic pollution um, <clears throat> impacts prospects and revenue generation forces public spending on restoring natural environment um, and causing significant loss to tourism operators. In terms of biodiversity, SIDS are home to many of, uh, to many of the most sensitive ecosystems and endangered flora and fauna. Plastic pollution threatens coral reef, um, mangrove, seagrasses, and many species of birds and um, uh, uh, marine animals. So coming to the Global um, Plastics Treaty and Remediation, Resolution 514 speaks to um, measures to reduce plastic pollution in the marine environment, including existing uh, plastic pollution and long-term elimination of plastic pollution in marine and other environments. Terrestrial legacy plastics is considered a downstream waste management issue within the jurisdiction of a country. Whilst marine plastic pollution remains to be governed comprehensively by a single regime. Um, there are millions of tons of plastic pollution in the marine environment continuing to invade ecosystems, impacting sea life and affecting food security. So efforts need to be placed on how to remediate this issue. And quite simply, we cannot end plastic pollution by ignoring the existing legacy plastic pollution has and its transboundary nature. So what we'd like to see come out of the negotiations are um, clear obligations surrounding research and development into safe, accessible and effective means of remediating plastic pollution in the marine environment, um, means of preventing leakage of plastic into the, Pacific, uh, into the environment, including the marine environment, um, efficient means of detecting and prioritizing hotspots of plastic pollution in the marine environment, for example, through risk assessments and data collection and provision of adequate resources for funding remediation mechanisms. So, and with that, um, thank you. And I apologize for taking uh, too much time. Thank you, Anima, and I think you provided, I think, a really clear illustration of the SIDS perspective on remediation there. 
And I particularly like um, that line on quite simply, we cannot end plastic pollution by ignoring the existing plastic pollution, which I thought was um, a very clear picture of what we needed to hear today. Um, so thank you for that, Anima. I will now pass the floor over to Dr. Harrington. Excellent. And um, I apologize in advance if you hear a barking dog. It is not mine. Um, I am currently in Geneva for the BRS uh, COP and overlooking a lovely park. But I hear a dog. So if you hear anything, that's it. Um, thank you all for the invitation to join today. It's a pleasure to, to be part of these uh, kind of unfolding series of discussions. Um, and just a few thoughts. I didn't make a slide presentation because I, I didn't want to take um, that much time, but just a few thoughts to kind of frame from the perspective of where the negotiations are going for the treaty and as we're so close to, to the next INT in Paris, um, to frame the idea of legacy plastics and to look at the legacy and remediation issue in light of what we've seen from the filings of various parties and various other organizations and stakeholders um, coming into the INC2 in Paris. And at INC1 in Uruguay, we heard some reference to legacy plastic, especially from the various SIDS. Um, but what's interesting is that while it's not as much of a named issue mm -hmm. as many of I like to see it be named amongst the state filings, we see coastal states as well as island states starting to join this discussion. So Ghana, Morocco, Egypt, um, Uruguay, states that are not necessarily SIDS are also raising this issue of legacy plastics. So this is a very good thing. It's a sign that the message has really started to slowly, I guess, get out. Um, but when we think of legacy plastics, what we need to do is remember that often this is lumped into the discussion of downstream um, regulation if we're thinking about the life cycle of plastics, but that it both is and also isn't part of the downstream discussion. And what I mean by that, or it shouldn't be, what I mean by that is that yes, in the future, there will be plastics that will potentially become legacy plastics if they're not regulated properly. We will do this under the, whatever we name the treaty, the plastics treaty. But at the same time, that won't necessarily address what we already have as legacy plastics in our oceans today. And whatever is created as a legacy plastic um, situation between now and whenever the treaty goes into effect. So what is important to remember is, first of all, the need to kind of create different strands of understanding of what we mean by downstream in the circular economy context, what we mean by it in the core obligation and regular context, and then also how we address the truly legacy plastics as of the date that the treaty goes into effect. Um, not just being forward thinking, but and, and this is very antithetical to most of us as lawyers to be a bit ex post facto in terms of thinking about how we handle all of these issues that will continue to plague us. Um, and there is always a very real challenge of addressing this in a way that um, most of us are not used to and where we aren't necessarily geared as lawyers, as legal specialists to creating backward looking treaties that are able to solve these problems, but we will have to, because even if as of January 1st, 2025, any deity willing or anything that you believe in willing, um, if we have a treaty and it goes into effect quite quickly thereafter, we will have to deal with these types of plastics. And so there will need to be a mechanism. Most likely it will need to be, have funding and when we're speaking of funding, this also is something that really does need to be addressed in the funding discussion is not only moving forward, how do we extend capacity and technology transfer, et cetera, but also how do we provide funding for states, especially SIDS, to deal with the issues of legacy plastics, um, not only in terms of funding for their removal from beaches, et cetera, but also where do they go? Because what we know from several prominent examples is that um, plastic pollution at the moment is that, especially states or smaller states, smaller geographically sized states, 
have created waste plans that are being vastly overrun by the plastics that they're currently having come into their territory in a, an unintended transboundary way. So these are not planned shipments. These are not uh, import export based ship shipments. I'm sorry, this was a discussion topic today at BRS, so it's in my head. Um, but these are you know truly unplanned. And as a result, this is something where the, the, the landfills and the waste systems are not equipped to handle it. So funding in terms of how do we transfer that waste out as well is something that we we do need to keep in mind. So I don't want to take any more time, Saeed. Um, I think we can have a much larger discussion, but I really just wanted to raise this as something where we have seen it um, in a few discussions in the filings from various states, um, especially in terms of hotspotting, but we haven't even seen that much of a discussion about how to handle the legacy plastics when this treaty does hopefully come into effect. Um, and it's obviously something that certainly the task force will be working on, but I would love input on as well from all of you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Harrington. And just so you know, we did not hear any docs. You're fine. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for your insights. And I think you asked some really pertinent questions there um, as it relates to financing, but also what do we do with the plastic, even um, at the point of remediation? And they're all uh, considerations that we have to incorporate in designing any type of mechanism under the treaty. Um, with that being said, I'll now pass the floor over to Dr. Zhao Ribeiro Bidao from Ocean Cleanup. Yes, I hope you can see my slide. I'll be very brief uh, and I will save myself, of course, for the Q&A and for our discussion. Uh, I'm here also to introduce you to the Ocean Cleanup. As some of you may know, we are an international nonprofit uh, project that aims to rid our oceans of the plastic pollution, of the legacy plastic pollution. Uh, founded in 10 years ago by Boyan Slot. He is now 28. Uh, the Ocean Cleanup consists of a very diverse team of around 140 members from 35 nationalities, which makes us indeed a global project. And our strategy is indeed a dual stemming plastic emissions that come from uh, rivers and cleaning up what uh, has already accumulated uh, in the ocean. And of course, developing the necessary technology has been a very challenging uh, journey, but we have, I believe we can all agree, uh, a year. And, and our motivation, of course, comes from the devastating impacts that we see uh, plastic pollution having, of course, on marine life, but also on coastal ecosystems, uh, which the people of the small island states have witnessed uh, firsthand. We see rich coastal systems uh, now smoothed by a thick layer of plastic, for instance, in the Caribbean Sea. Uh, we see fish cut open to reveal their guts full of sharp plastic fragments and the sea turtles that are recurrently found uh, entangled in giant uh, abundant fishing uh, nets that are simply bobbing around in the Great Pacific uh, garbage patch. But in order to solve this crisis, which is massive, by the way, we must first understand it. And our research team has invested the millions into cutting edge uh, studies that produced the first comprehensive map of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. We now know uh, how much is there and where it is, and it's three times the size of France or two times the size of Texas. We also know that the global plastic production rate is now estimated, and I, I keep seeing different uh, numbers, but the latest I've seen is 400 million metric tons per year, and it is indeed expected to triple by 2060, according to the OECD. And so the message here is that we must decouple plastic production from riverine plastic emissions. And important to note that, again, I see different figures of, of, of 10 million tons uh, leaking, but our models show much less. And it shows that only 0.25% of produced plastic ends up in the ocean. But of course, the impact of those 0.25% on marine life, on ocean health, and coastal communities is uh, very high. So a choice perhaps to be made throughout this, these discussions is whether we focus all our attention and resources, all the media attention and activism on 99.75% of plastic produced that does not enter the ocean, or if we start by immediately addressing those 0.25% that leak and actually 
Lumber, in some cases, floating for decades in the ocean. The, the oldest plastic we are finding are from the 60s, by the way. Stopping the leakage is, of course, not uh, enough. We must address the legacy pollution already in our oceans. Uh, we know that it is accumulating in five main areas, with the Great Pacific Garbage Patch being the largest and most studied. And the plastic in these patches is shown to be uh, highly persistent, causing ongoing harm while continuously degrading into nano and microplastics, making any remediation or removal much harder in the future. And that's why I'm not entirely convinced that we can simply wait for the years of the negotiation of the treaty or, or any software instrument that comes out of it. So we cannot wait for all the ratifications needed or to enter into force until it trickles down to actual action, because this is indeed an emergency. In any case, I'm here also to share with you good news, because our cleanup systems have shown success. They are cleaning the Great Pacific Garbage Patch at a rate of one football field worth of ocean every 10 seconds. And independent experts, and including independent entities in the Netherlands and the government and the parliament, have attested to its effectiveness and its safety. And with just one prototype still testing, we have cleaned 0.2% of the GPGP. Deploying full uh, uh, systems will allow us to clean the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And I will engage also with you in this discussion on how uh, an international legal obligation is possible under the treaty and how there are already examples in the in, in international law to enable that uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I have to say, uh, a lot of the imagery there was quite disturbing to see the amount of plastics that was being collected there and to think of how much is out there and how much we need. We still need to um, extend efforts to remediate. Um, so I appreciate that very much. Um, now I'm going to pass the floor on to Aydun Ragnarod. Thank you, Saeed. Uh, so, hi everyone. My name is Idun Rungniru. I'm a research scientist at the Norwegian Institute for Water Research and have been following the Plastics Treaty negotiations for the past few years. Uh, I would like to just reiterate what has been mentioned by several before me that even though we do know that we do need to address upstream issues such as the unsustainable consumption and production of plastics, it is also evident that there are enormous amounts of plastics in our oceans and also in terrestrial areas that will need to be cleaned up. And this is recognized both in the resolution 514 to start the negotiations, but we also see it reflected in the elements document that has been prepared by the Secretariat and the Bureau, highlighting a, a few potential measures that could address legacy plastics under the treaty. And I want to dive a bit more into that aspect of what, how could legacy plastics potentially be addressed under a future, future treaty? Um, and some of the considerations that we also need to take into account in the, in the design of future measures. As someone who has followed the negotiations, I find it helpful to think about this in terms of the core concept of sustainable development, that the measures that we design will need to consider the social dimensions, the environmental dim dimensions and also the economic dimensions to find the most appropriate measures and avoiding problem shifting between different environmental and social problems. When it comes to maximizing the environmental benefits of cleaning up plastics, as was mentioned in the introduction, there's a need to really identify the most appropriate areas to clean up, the hotspots, as is being done already in some parts of the world uh, with the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, for instance, but also localized hotspots in different countries. Um, and what was proposed by the Secretariat um, and several member states is the development, for instance, of guidelines, uh, best practices, or criteria for identifying and or for supporting member states in identifying uh, where and how and one should really do the legacy cleanup uh, activities. Uh, so as mentioned, one could then take one aspect of this being that we need to identify the most risky and problematic plastics. That means addressing particularly harmful plastics such as fishing gear, but also 
potentially prioritizing cleanup activities in areas that are especially vulnerable to plastics pollution, such as mangroves that provide vital ecosystem services and areas with high densities. We also need to consider and could potentially include in the development of guidelines or criteria um, measures to consider the negative impacts that different cleanup activities can have, whether that is ensuring um, or setting targets for minimizing the bycatch um, from marine uh, collection devices, but also identifying best practices in terms of avoiding the erosion associated with beach cleanups, especially if you're using mechanized technologies, um, as well as the risk of remobilizing chemicals if you're disturbing seafloors where there's been a lot of industrial pollution over time. So there's a lot of really interesting issues here that we need to address when we get down to the nitty gritty and the details under a future treaty. Uh, and in the design of any such measures, it's crucial to include and take a multi-stakeholder approach, including both science, uh, as a scientist, I have to say that, um, but also the member states, indigenous peoples, local communities who know the areas best, and businesses uh, and civil society who work with cleanups, both from a technological perspective, but also from the grassroots cleanup approaches and activities. Um, I see I'm running a bit out of time, but I also want to just highlight the importance uh, and something that hasn't been discussed much yet, which is the cost efficiency of cleanups and recognizing that sometimes manual cleanups may be a more appropriate approach than technological devices in certain conditions, as has, for instance, been reported following the express pearl spill of pellets outside of Sri Lanka, where there were donations of Real, quite fancy and exciting technical equipment, but that wasn't fit for the environmental conditions that we were meant to clean, and that also were expensive to use and had expensive spare parts, and where it might have been more fruitful and have, we might have collected more uh, pellets if that money was instead spent on more locally appropriate approaches and methods. Um, and finally, I want to really just highlight um, what I believe Alexandra also touched upon, the potentials for the treaty to include measures on financing mechanisms. And this is also mentioned in the elements paper. Uh, so I think I'll stop there and thank you so much. And I look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. And I did note as well, I think a lot of what you resonated in terms of taking a, a multi-stakeholder approach and the, the importance of um, local knowledge systems and traditional knowledge is something that would definitely be uh, resonating with the SIDS as well. Um, I noticed as well that you touched on ghost gear, so I will now hand the floor over to Hannah. Yes. Go ahead, Hannah. Thank you so much and thank you again for the invitation to be here. It's great to hear the, the discussions and um, the different perspectives from all the panelists so far. So as I mentioned, um, my name is Hannah Pragnall Rash. I'm from the Global Ghost Gear Initiative and here today to provide the perspective about um, abandoned, lost and discarded fishing gear and how it can be integrated in the legally binding instrument and within that the opportunities to support um, SIDS as well. So sorry, getting used to the different buttons. So just as a um, quick background to the Global Ghost Gear Initiative for those who aren't familiar, we are a multi-sectoral um, alliance of various um, members from governments to not-for-profit organizations through to gear manufacturers, anyone basically involved in the entire supply chain of fishing gear. So it's a collaborative effort um, ensuring that everyone that's involved across the whole supply chain of fishing, fishing gear is um, included in the conversation. So our three pillars of work um, are focused around building evidence. So um, building that data um, in order to inform and help guide where policy and retrieval um, should be focused 
and also identifying hotspot areas where gear is accumulating. So that feeds then into um, our other pillar of work, defining best practice and informing policy. So we have some tools that are voluntary guidelines that nations, any anyone can really adopt from all the different um, stakeholders that we work with identifying best practices for the management of fishing gear in capture fisheries, but also for the management of aquaculture gear as well. So those best practices are defined across prevention strategies, mitigation strategies, and also remediation strategies, which is obviously what we're focusing on today, that issue of legacy gear that is already in the environment. And then the third pillar of our work is around um, catalyzing and replicating solutions. So having projects on the ground where we're implementing these best practices and recognizing that depending on the location, those best practices may vary. So what works in one location doesn't necessarily work in another location, which is particularly important when we're thinking about um, SIDS as well. Um, and some of our work to date is focused on the Caribbean and also in Vanuatu as well. And just through that work in, its, in itself, we can see how some of the measures that are relevant and work in Vanuatu, for example, don't necessarily transfer to um, the practicality in the Caribbean region due to different, different challenges within the, within the different areas. So that's something that's quite key with the work is, is having measures that are able to be adapted to suit local situations. So as far as the um, legally binding instrument is considered, the Global Ghost Gear Initiative is housed under the Ocean Conservancy. And as our areas of priority for inclusion in the ILBI, um, as you can see here, there's provisions, we're recommending provisions around microplastics, also the inclusion of the informal waste sector, as well as a design for circularity um, and the source reduction of plastics, in addition to obviously provisions around ghost gear, which is what this is focusing on here. So in terms of addressing ghost gear, one thing that we've recognized in the conversations to date is that even though the resolution obviously is specifically including marine pollution, um, the conversations have currently been more focused on land-based sources rather than sea-based sources. So, of course, being the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, which is you know a global thought leader in the in the field, we are of course encouraging member states to recognize the pervasiveness of abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear, and recognizing that it's one of the most impactful or the most impactful. Um, form of marine plastic pollution and also recognizing with that as well how SIDS are disproportionately impacted by the effects of ghost fishing gear. So ensuring that specific language is included in the in, in instrument is critical to ensuring that we are addressing ALDFD, ALDFG sorry, holistically um, and taking advantage of this once in a lifetime opportunity to ensure that we are addressing the issue globally. So to date, the instruments and frameworks that are in place to manage fishing gear are largely piecemeal and quite fragmented. So this really is a critical opportunity to formalize those existing frameworks are there and not, not let them be a reason for inaction or lack of inclusion of ghost gear to be included within the within the instrument. So what we are what we are proposing for inclusion is that obviously, of course, off the back of the options paper that was released a couple of weeks ago now, um, that we are recommending that one of the one of the core obligations to be considered by the committee should be the inclusion um, for specifically reducing abandoned, lost or otherwise discarded fishing gear. 
And in order to support member states in the negotiations and provide that information and background rationale as to why we believe it's so important that ALDFG is specifically included, we've actually um, developed a series of recommendations, both binding and non-binding measures for inclusion of um, management strategies for fishing gear from capture fisheries and also aquaculture. So that's applying our existing best practice frameworks for those two fields um, and applying that for inclusion into the ILBI. So that's something we've been working on with our existing member governments, but also speaking to obviously um, other member states as well that to gain that support because of course we can put forward the recommendations but it's the member states that are going to be there on the floor um, putting the motions forward so that's a sort of brief overview of, of um, what the Global Ghost Gear Initiative is doing to help ensure that fishing gear is addressed within the within the instrument. Um, so all to say, thank you very much for the time and um, I'll stop there and look forward to the discussions and on the ground at INC2 for those that will be there, we do have a, a um, strong delegation there that won't that is there to discuss obviously the issue of fishing gear, but also more broadly um, on the other elements as well to be included in the in the instrument. So thank you. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, I think given the time constraint and, and the fact that our Q&A box is blowing up, um, we're going to kind of struggle between some of the questions here. And I think um, jumping off of Hannah's point in terms of what you envision um, for an obligation under the treaty, we will start the discussion with the question um, as posted in the Q&A. Remediation has been identified as a standalone core obligation in UNEP options for elements paper. We heard from the panel that remediation should be addressed at different points in the instrument as a core obligation and in downstream measures. Are there views on other core obligations in the elements paper that could be expanded to accommodate remediation concerns in a way making remediation a cross-cutting issue? Um, I think jumping off from Hannah's presentation, we can start with her and then we can move down the line to Dr. Harrington and follow suit, whoever else wants to contribute. Thanks so much. And yeah, it's a it's a great question. And I think it's something that probably rings true as well, that many of these things can be adopted as cross-cutting themes as well. So I guess one of the challenges is identifying those sort of core buckets, if you want to call them that and then determining which should be the core streams and then what are the cross-cutting themes. Um, I think there's definitely opportunity to have remediation as you, as you suggest um, across as a cross-cutting theme. Um, but then I guess the flip side of that, if it isn't specified as an obligation, does it lose the sort of spe specificity in the actions that is needed and the attention required? Um, so it will be interesting to see how the, the negotiations continue at INC2 in Paris at the end of the month and also looking forward to obviously the zero draft that will be coming off the off the back of that. So I'm not sure that's really an answer to the question, probably just more of a an, an agreement with the, you know, the theory and the idea behind it. You're yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Harrington, would you like to reply? Absolutely. And please, there's no need for formality. Alex, Alexandra is fine. <laughs> no, Alex is perfectly acceptable. Um, so I think that I completely agree with Hannah. Um, I also think that having something as a core obligation itself doesn't necessarily mean we can't also think of it as being cross-cutting and that it can't be part of other core obligations. So when we think about the, the obligations paper and the ideas that have come out of it, uh, we can think about this as something that would go into principles. So when we think about principles, precaution, EPR, um, all of these different traditional or expanding on traditional environmental principles uh, and sustainable development principles, these all could easily include remediation and it would need to be specified, arguably, but that easily could be something that, that could be discussed. Um, and I also think the other issue that tends to be kind of 
pigeonholed often in the labor context, but is very important for remediation is the idea of just transitions. And as we think about just transitions and we think about shifting away and shifting communities in different um, practices, et cetera, we do also need to think about remediation as an element of that, not only in terms of how we're orienting people in their training and what they're doing in their own um, vocational lives, but also as a just transition in the circular economy that then allows us to recognize there is a requirement to address legacy plastics as part of the circular economy fallout or the pre-circular economy fallout, if you will. So I think there are a number of different ways to have these intersections. Um, and cross-cutting can be very potentially daunting, but it also can be very powerful. Um, and it can be something where we really do realize that as much as there are these intersections, um, different arguments can be used to back up each other. So it's it's challenging, but I think there's a lot of room there for growth and discussion. And hopefully at INC2, we can have more of these conversations um, formally and informally. Thank you. And Dr. Zhao, would you like to? Well, just very briefly, I, I, I would prefer for obligation. I, I have concerns that uh, making it across the board will dilute uh, the attention, the political priority, the capacity to attract financing, uh, to mobilize also uh, uh, resources to accountability to check if indeed things are being done. And so in that sense, I do feel that the core obligation would be the best uh, approach. And by the way, I mean, I don't want to make this a legal discussion, but some argue that there is already out there an international legal obligation, a little bit diluted, even though it's not clear that it, it can be extended to, to plastic pollution. But, but some conventions already have uh, provisions that, that would go in the same direction. There's the, 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 the Convention of the Protection for the Marine Environment on the Northeast Atlantic, for instance. There's, of course, Article 194 of the Law of the Sea. But there's also, interestingly, um, a convention that provides for an obligation to coordinate in eliminating pollution, which is in Article 16 of the Protocol for the Protection of the Caspian Sea. Uh, there is also one that includes provisions regarding the reimbursement of assistant costs, Regulation 9 of Annex 7 of the 1992 Helsinki Convention. The point being, there is stuff already out there, but since this is a global plastics treaty, I think we would all benefit to have a very explicit legal obligation building on existing more diluted obligations out there uh, and fragmented um, so that we make clear that the problem needs uh, resolution. Thank you. And on, on that note, um, I was wondering whether even beyond the context of plastics, but ha are there any models in current international legal framework that speak to remediation um, in other contexts that could possibly be mirrored or learned from um, for the context of remediation of plastic pollution in this INC process? I'm going to throw that back to you, Dr. Zhao, and then maybe I'll go back to Alexandra. <laughs> I think Alexander is in a better position to answer that oh, question. I was, I was but, actually but... going to defer to you. Um, <laughs> so I think we do certainly have some examples from the Montreal Protocol, um, perhaps being the most successful, the most obvious. Yeah. Um, in addition, it's actually quite interesting to hear and be part of the discussions for uh, the BRS COP this week and last week, um, because as much as it is very much chemicals and, and hazardous waste focused, there are many more discussions now about remediation in this and about issues of uh, remediation coupled with also issues of substitution and ensuring the safety of substitution, et cetera. So I think not only do we have some good examples from the past, we also have really helpful emerging discussions on where remediation is going in already established regimes that can help us not only see what future discussions might look like for plastics, but also potentially how to draft in a way to avoid some of these issues um, or enhance others. Um, so it is it is indeed fascinating. But the fact that that's fascinating is also telling about my, my own sense of fun anyway. <laughs> I, I want to, if I may just add a point, because sure. sometimes we, we forget the key point here is that we are talking about international waters of areas beyond national jurisdiction. And that adds to my argument that indeed having an explicit obligation would create this collective uh, obligation for a collective problem. So that's, that's technically decisive to have any action uh, on this particular type of pollution. 
And I think um, uh, in terms of the discussion we have right now, one of the things we noted with the state submissions is that some of them that did support remediation only supported it to the extent of within national jurisdictions. Um, so I thought that was an interesting um, point following from what you just stated. Um, but I also wanted to have like a general understanding as to why do you think that there isn't that much uh, traction towards remediation as a core obligation in areas beyond national jurisdiction or even within? We've noted that, um, like you rightfully said, um, Alexandra, that now it's, it's starting to gain traction, albeit still slow. What do you think are these main challenges that need to be unpacked so we can make sure this stays on the table and carries all the way through to an agreement at the end of 2024? So I think there's a lot of trying to still feel out what the main priority area will be. And I think that until there's a sense of comfort amongst all the states as to how we prioritize upstream and midstream and downstream, um, there will always be a bit of hedging. And one of the easiest ways to hedge is on remediation um, because it, again, it requires us to think about the past it requires us to adjust from a legal and scientific practice the past in a way that we're not used to doing. Um, and it's often very unpleasant or difficult to, to sell, if you will, as a point for multiple states, for developing and developed states, um, to address something that's already there and already been done. So I think that is part of the reason why. And countering that and explaining to developed and developing states alike that we may have a brilliant document and we may have a brilliant piece of legislation at the international level, but it still won't mean that the, the fish that you're a fishing fleet is going to be pulling out of the water will be any safer for years to come because we have legacy plastics. And that even if you are a highly developed state, like for example, Japan, you won't have a number of issues with plastic pollution coming up on your shores if you don't address legacy plastics. So getting to it that way, I think, is a really important um, discussion point and entry point for how we might move on with that. I don't know, just to be with Alex, and we're debating this, but uh, just perhaps unveiling a little bit of a possible discussion. Will we have a parallel discussion like loss and damage for, for climate change uh, to, to frame this, this approach? There's also a, a very interesting challenge in, challenge in international environmental law, which is, of course, attribution. Uh, remediation, by the way, uh, helps knowing what is out there and therefore helps have access to hard data and therefore helps to attribute responsibility. For example, because of our catch, indeed, the large part is fishing gear and we conducted and published research that studied 6,000 pieces of collected plastic and was able to attribute to five main economies. I will not name them today, it's published the origin of the fishing gear. But that, that data allows for an attribution conversation. And therefore, the, the, the drafting of the article will also have, of the provision will also have to have that in, in, into consideration, of course. Thank you, of course. And on, on the topic of, of, of existing models and regimes and so on, um, Hannah I do, and Idu, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on this question, but on ghost gear, how do you envision the future instrument working with other bodies, such as RFMOs and international governmental organizations, to address this concern in a more effective or holistic way? I think that's a great question as well, and actually one that came up. We had a, um, a roundtable last week or the week before with our government members. Um, to discuss the proposed recommendations that we were putting forward and the integration with our FMOs was exactly one of those questions that came up from one of our uh, member governments. So I think it's definitely something that needs to be considered and integrated into any recommendations that do um, end up in the in the treaty, in the instrument, sorry, for, um, for fishing gear and recognizing that the, the instrument from our perspective, I guess um, I should say, is that it should complement those existing measures that are in place. Um, and as I said before, it shouldn't, the challenges and also the existing frameworks that 
are currently in place, not just with regards to, to fishing gear, but other elements of plastic should not be reason to negate them being specified within the, um, within the instrument itself. So I think identifying that in integration and um, being clear about what that looks like will definitely be important as the negotiations proceed. Thank you. Any Dune, any comments on building this kind of holistic approach to it? I, I must admit, I, I'm not very familiar with that specific issue. So I think I'll, I'll give the word back to you, Said. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I think uh, a lot of the, the questions in the Q&A have been surrounding the kind of impacts or potential impacts of remediation technologies. Um, I would perhaps throw this back to you, Idun, but also Dr. Rivero. Um, I think too, you've managed to uh, straddle some of the answering to, to that question, but I think if you can provide um, some quick insights as to, you know, um, how we can improve or build on technologies and how we've been mitigating any risks to the environment by employing these technologies. Uh, if you can provide some insights on those, that'll be really helpful. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to clarify that because indeed the media tends to oversimplify our mission. Sometimes I read people saying that we just have a net uh, sweeping the ocean and catching everything. But I, I want to take this opportunity to tell you that actually our top priority in all the ocean operation is the prevention of uh, impact on marine life. We have conducted the first ever environmental impact assessment in the area, which basically provides a, a baseline for future activities. Uh, we implement environmental impact uh, uh, plans to minimize the risks. And I really want to go into detail so that you have a sense of how the so-called fishing net is designed. We have design measures that include, for instance, a large mesh size that allows for small marine uh, animals to, to pass through. There are escape aids to enable safe exits. We have dedicated spaces for air breathing animals. Our crew can trigger an emergency release to free any, any animal in distress. We use green LED lights, light colored meshing, and acoustic deterrence to increase detectability of the system. And we also have operational measures which involves the system's slow movement. It goes at a speed that it's about half walking distance speed, which allows for most animals to, to swim away. We minimize any acoustic energy and nighttime lighting to reduce disturbance to wildlife. And also our minimal environmental impact operation mode is activated whenever a protected species is uh, uh, spotted. We have spotters on, on the system, on the ships. Uh, and of course, we have the emergency release system. So there's a lot of measures that are put in place. A full report on bycatch was published on our website. We can only dream. We can only dream of a world where fishing activities all over the world would have the same levels of bycatch, which is under one percent. So uh, if people are aware of the levels of bycatch and impact of fishing activities on protected species, and if you compare our update on our website you will see that we can actually inspire other industries to adopt this type of measures to reduce the impact on marine life. And we do all of this, by the way, because we signed this covenant with the Netherlands, a covenant that actually inspired some of the discussions of the High Seas Treaty. We provided a briefing to several negotiators, and we have committed ourselves to the rule of law even before the High Seas Treaty was fully uh, completed. So we are very proud of that and we hope to continue to improve this uh, this operation, of course. Thank you. And um, I'll just crave your indulgence for like five more minutes, panelists. I hope you don't mind. But um, as you can see, the questions are really coming in. Um, and for um, Idun, I was wondering if you would like to imply on um, how can the treaty help to improve, but also help to facilitate the development of technology and methodologies for remediation, and what are some of the primary environmental concerns that this technology would have to abate? And I think we've already touched on some of those, but I'd be great for your insights. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to also just highlight uh, some research that's coming out of my research institute and my colleagues uh, who are working on decision matrices to also support in the choice and sort of where do you choose to do uh, cleanup activities and what kinds of methods and so on. And I think that kind of cooperation and expanding on the research that's being done, bringing science together with the actors who also design 
uh, cleanup technologies might be an important pathway forward and also exchange between different organizations that design uh, cleanup technologies. And I think you, know, you make a really important point here that you are held to quite high standards because you get a lot of attention. Um, but we also do see, uh, as has been mapped by our colleagues at Duke University, that there's a large expansion in the number of actors producing technologies and entering sort of the cleanup market. Uh, and so learning from each other on that and build having this attention from the treaty might also be helpful in ensuring that the technologies that are being used are held to equal standards. Yeah, I think that's a really excellent point. And um, in light of the time constraints, I will just have to ask one final question of all the panelists. And um, I will just start down the line, but the question will be, um, what do you think would be the most effective model or mechanism for remediation under the treaty, but also um, keeping in mind how that would relate to other aspects, including um, financing? And just to provide some context, we've seen, for example, through the Ghana submission um, to the um, UNEP Secretariat, we saw that there was a um, global plastic pollution fee being proposed um, that's kind of like um, bridging the gap between financing and EPR. We were seeing a lot of um, ideas about that. Um, not, not trying to feed you a line there, but uh, in terms of your own personal um, thoughts, what would you think would be the most effective model, keeping in mind these other um, cross cutting issues, including financing? And we'll start with Hannah and work our way down. Thanks so much. Um, I think in terms of the implementation, it's obviously important to remember that there's going to be the, well, we hope there will be the, the binding um, and also the voluntary mechanisms. So part of what we've suggested is um, obviously supporting and informing those vol voluntary, me voluntary measures through national action plans, which obviously doesn't just ring true for um, fishing gear specifically, but can can be integrated under other national plans of actions for whatever aspect of plastic pollution um, and remediation obviously is a, a key part of that. So I think the that link between the binding and non-binding aspects of the um, measures that will essentially be implemented is definitely key to remembering that. And also in terms of the, um, the financing, I mean, that's going to, that's the question on everyone's lips, isn't it? That who's, you know, how a, how a nation's going to implement these measures, particularly those that are um, less economically developed as well um, and don't necessarily have the same resources as other nations. So in the options paper, it does put forward some, some mechanisms to assist with that financing. Um, but I think there's definitely a need to ensure that SIDS and also other less economically developed nations as a whole are also considered specifically in that as well and identified um, measures to provide assistance for, for those nations. I think that's going to be an important specification that's going to need to be included as well. Thank you, Hannah. we we'll move on to Alexander. Of course. Um, so I, again, completely agree with Hannah. I think that the uh, national action plans or whatever they're called will be critical. Um, and I think that having this as a, a binding in the sense of required element in the reporting itself will be very important. So not just making it voluntary inclusion if you want, but making it required, um, which would then link with the potential for compliance review and oversight. And if there is something like a global stock take, like we're seeing, hopefully um, seeing this year, uh, we haven't had it yet, so I can't say we were seeing <laughs> um, under UNFCCC, then that would be think, quite valuable, quite useful um, it, in terms of entrenching it and making it something that is quantifiable from the beginning and then where there is accountability from the beginning. Um, certainly, we know that governments will struggle a great deal to implement this on the ground. I'm actually working as part of a, a NORAD project with Grid Arundel and IUCN with um, five West African countries that are trying to figure out how to negotiate and then implement the treaty. And this will certainly be a critical issue. And what we know is it's not just funding, it's also capacity building. So making sure that whatever the funding mechanism is, 
isn't just providing money and throwing money at a problem. Um, it's also providing capacity, providing technological knowledge and information um, and guidance as to how to do this so that it's more than just here's some money, go figure it out. Um, but we really, you know, it, it, it is a much larger issue. Um, also, I think this one kind of final point to remember when we're thinking about this is that as Joao had alluded to, there was a conversation about uh, loss and damage and loss and damage in the UNFCCC context. And there is much for us to learn in terms of how that became such a very politically um, heavy and burdened issue. And so addressing this early on and creating as strong a set of guidelines as we can for including remediation throughout the treaty, including funding, can be very valuable so that we don't have those conversations coming up in this context and have to go through the whole concept again when we really just need to get to the crux of the issue. So thank you very much. Thank you. And Idun? Yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to come up with something new and all of the really important points have been made, but I think it's it's, the key thing that I would like to highlight is really the need for a systems perspective and thinking about legacy plastics. Um, as uh, Alex mentioned, we can't uh, address legacy plastics with only money. We can't like, address it with only guidelines. We need to have it included throughout both the core obligations and the uh, implementation measures. So I think I'm just going to turn your question on its head really and finish <laughs> with that. Thank you. And Dr. Zhao? Yes, very briefly, just a couple of ideas. Uh, we do think that measuring, monitoring, reviewing plastic emissions can potentially be a very strong accountability instrument, not just because you are intercepting the plastic before it goes, but because over time you will be able to uh, monitor trends. If the plastic flows keep going up, that means that upstream and midstream policies are not working, regardless of what is uh, announced, said, published, you know. So it's a strong accountability uh, uh, mechanism to monitor riverine plastic emissions, a little bit like the carbon emissions. I think it could be a good control measure. The second point on, on financing, uh, I'm slightly more optimistic. Uh, I mean, I just saw some interesting data that in the past five years, there have been six jackpots exceeding 1 billion US dollars in the US. I mean, money sometimes it's not really the problem, it's allocation of resources that is the, the thing. And so that's based on political priorities. Uh, and so, yeah, I would say that there are instruments that we know that can work. And a good example, and I can share with you that we are discussing with some uh, international partners, is these blended finance mechanisms that we already see in different contexts. But in a nutshell, basically, you have a bond, the donors, investors, would uh, invest in the bond. The principal would be managed by a multilateral development bank to invest in waste management uh, um, uh, infrastructure. And then the development bank would give the interest instead to the investor to clean up remediation initiatives. And so this can be done with private and public uh, funders, with uh, debt uh, investment, uh, with pension funds, institutional funders, but it is possible, it is technically possible, technically possible, and it's not really financially that dramatic when we compare with so many other things that we are spending money on uh, currently. Thank you, and I think with that, we will unfortunately have to cut our discussion today, but we had, I think, a ra rather invigorating um, dialogue on a lot of the issues to impact here. And I think a lot of the major findings are that we can't just also look at remediation in a silo, but also um, have an appreciation for the, the cross-cutting, potential cross-cutting um, aspects of the ECU. But more than anything, there must be something to um, ensure that there is the advancement of research and development into safe, accessible, and effective means of remediating under the instrument. So um, that being said, I would like to thank all the panelists for a great discussion. I'm sorry we couldn't go on much longer, but... Um, I think in terms of the SIDS talk plastic series, I think it warrants um, a second iteration if you're all willing. Um, we would definitely appreciate it. Um, and secondly, we have a second installment next Thursday, May 18th, on EPR and lessons to learn from developing countries. So we urge you to um, hit the re registration link in the chat box. And um, once again, thank you to all of the panelists and thank you for all of you for joining. Take care. 
Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.